All right, we are ready to kick things off at the three minute mark. Hello everyone, and thanks for attending today's event, Unleash Data Superpowers in Atlassian Cloud. I'm Catherine, the Product Marketing Manager for Structure for GR Cloud, and I'll be today's host. Today's session will be focused on formulas, the newest structure feature we've just released on Jira Cloud. It's a handy, flexible, and powerful feature that lets you do real-time calculations directly in Jira. So if you're a cloud user completely new to this feature, we hope that by the end of this session, you'll be armed with the basics that you can put to use right away. And if there are any server or data center users in the audience, you've likely come across formulas already, but that's totally fine. While the focus is on cloud, everything that we'll cover today also applies to server and data center. And bonus, you'll also get to see what's currently supported on cloud in case you're planning a migration. Now moving on to a few housekeeping points. All attendee microphones are muted and they will remain that way throughout the session. So you don't need to worry about background noise. If you do have questions, please, please, please use the Q&A feature and not the chat. I repeat, not the chat for submitting questions. We'll aim to answer all of your questions at the end of the session. The chat is rather for sharing any comments or feedback and for us to share any resource links and the like. Finally, this session is being recorded. We'll send you a follow-up email with a link to the recording. So if you need to leave early or if your colleagues can't make it, it's a great chance for them to learn about formulas too. And that's it for housekeeping. Now, I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Nicholas Ellis our senior solutions engineer here at ALM Works. He helps new and existing users alike get the most out of structure. And he's also one of our in-house formulas gurus. So you're in very good hands. Without further ado, further ado take it away, Nick. Thanks, Catherine. So um, <clears throat> this is what I want to uh, go over today. But before we get too deep into the agenda, I just want to know a little bit about uh, the audience today. So I'm just going to share a quick poll to get some feedback from uh, from you guys about where we're approaching this from. Um, There we go. Sorry, had a little bit of trouble. Just launched the Zoom poll there. <laughs> Just a little technical difficulty. Um, but yeah, please tell us a little bit about your uh, your experience with uh, with formulas. Looks like we got a lot of people new to formulas. That's great. You're in the right place. Um, it looks like we've got some people familiar with the uh, on-prem version of formulas. So that'll also be good. Uh, all right, and we got some formula experts, some people who are very, very comfortable with formulas. I'll be, I'll be looking out for those very intimidating questions as we uh, move along here. Um, so yeah, it looks like, oh wow, and we also got 100% participation in the poll. I appreciate having such an active audience. Um, so, um, so yeah, it looks like about half of us are, uh, are new to structure formulas. And about a quarter of us have used them on, on Jira Cloud. So I'm guessing um, a lot of people are, are, you know, kind of have played with this just a little bit, um, but, uh, but probably have some, some questions. So I think you guys are, are in the right place. And uh, yeah, well, let's just jump right in. So um, yeah, I'll start today with talking about an introduction, the kind of data types and variables. Um, and then the different functions that we can use to uh, to pull things together. Ultimately, that's all Expert is trying to do is take data from different places in Jira um, and coalesce that information into a single field value. Um, so what is Expert? Um, Expert is the formula language that we're using to write formulas. It's an expression language. Um, so what this means in more technical terms is that it's you know, for doing kind of uh, mathematical and calculative uh, sort of things, it's not necessarily like a full-fledged uh, programming language. This certainly doesn't mean that it's not powerful. It's just kind of the approach that it takes. Um, 
expert, in addition to being able to look at just general JIRA fields, also lets us look up and down the hierarchy. This can be really helpful. So if we're at like a story level, we can look down to the subtasks or we can look up to the epic. Um, maybe we have multiple levels of hierarchy above the epic. Maybe we're grouping up to components and other things. There's a lot of really interesting questions that we can ask, and all of them are going to be built on the context of what we have available in the structure board. Um, experts really good at performing these calculations, taking different fields and, and kind of combining them together into one metric. Um, it has a lot of built-in functions as well as the ability to define your own. So um, if you don't find exactly what you're looking for, um, you know, we can create our own functions. We, we have a lot of flexibility around that. And this uh, last one is kind of one of my favorites. Just like everything else in structure, we're always dealing with real-time data. We're always looking at live data in JIRA. So this means that if a field changes, we're going to see that field immediately um, update. And if one of the fields that expert is built on changes, it's going to update its calculation. Um, so we'll see some examples of that as how the expert formula columns are basically listening for any updates to the underlying data in the view. So why is expert a superpower? Like, why is this useful? Um, so there's a lot of cool things that, uh, that we can do with expert. I expect today we'll kind of scratch the surface. We're definitely not gonna be able to get to everything you could possibly do with, uh, with JIRA. But um, you know, if we're exporting data from JIRA, it means that that data is going to be out of date. So we can do these things in, you know, BI tools, Excel, Google Sheets, or some other formula, um, you know, some other tool that allows us to kind of write formulas and do these calculations. But there's always going to be that kind of lag, you know, did we export this yesterday or last week or maybe even longer ago? Um, you know, what if something changes right now? Um, you know, there's a lot of other questions. There's a lot of other kind of bumps in the road. So just having everything in JIRA, listening for those changes, like always having a real-time up-to-date view, you know, when you're looking at it, it's right. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can do with, uh, with formulas. I personally like it for the finding edge cases. There's often, you know, a thousand issues in a board and we're looking for ones that have this weird thing that is wrong. Um, so maybe they were completed after the end of the sprint or maybe um, you know, they don't match their parents' uh, version or components. Um, you know, identifying uh, items that don't match a particular set of, uh, of um, fields or, or calculations in uh, expert can be really, really easy. And we can do more complex things that wouldn't really be possible with just filtering. So we can um, answer some really, really complicated questions. Um, of course, it's good for extracting those meaningful insights. There's a lot of data density that we often deal with in, uh, in JIRA. We don't want to be cross-referencing different, you know, formulas and, and doing our own math. You know, we, we, can, <laughs> you can, we can offload that onto, uh, onto expert. Um, also, uh, verifying that all issues like match a certain criteria, making sure that they look a particular way. This is where we can kind of often have something where like, we define our own status. These items look good. These items look questionable. These items look like they might have some risk associated with them. Um, and that can be based on multiple different fields. It can be um, you know, very uh, up to your own definition. And then the last one is, is probably the most common uh, is, you know, just coalescing a lot of data points into a single metric. So maybe we've got, you know, a cost of delay and a risk and, you know, a lot of other information that we want to put into one number uh, that's like, this is what we should work on first, or this is the most important item based on current um, conditions. There's a lot of ways that we can, you know, take a lot of different fields and say, all right, all of these are going to combine into one score. Um, and, and kind of unify that. So we don't have to look at 10 different fields to understand what's going on. We can kind of, um, you know, condense that into a single uh, field value. So where do we start with, uh, with formulas? So we've got this little plus over here where we add columns. And of course we can add a lot of different things, but uh, you know, if we just search for formula, I usually just do FOR and that kind of gets me to, uh, to formula. Um, and um, it acts like, an attribute column. So what do I mean by an attribute column? Um, an attribute is anything that is calculated based off of JIRA fields. So for example, a um, progress column. Our progress column is not a field in JIRA. We're not pointing to a progress field. We're basing progress on some other fields. So progress might be based on status. 
Um, so status is the JIRA field. That's like an actual thing in the database that JIRA has access to. And then based on that information, we're calculating an attribute, which is some percentage of, uh, of progress. Um, all formula columns by their very definition are attributes. They're being calculated based off of some fields in JIRA. Um, and in theory, they could be calculated off of uh, other attributes. But, um, but yeah, we add it just like any other column. And then as soon as we add it, we'll get a, uh, a screen like this. So um, when you're starting out with your first formula, I would definitely start out with number one. You definitely want to name it something other than formula, especially when you have multiple formula columns all named formula. You're just you're going to not have a fun time. So um, it's tempting to just jump in and, and write the code. You're like, oh, I, I know what I want to do here. You know, I, I want to pull in these variables and, and this and that. Um, but please start. Give it a name. Um, it's, it's always a great place to uh, to start. Then number two, we're going to want to put some formula code in this body right here. And um, as usual, writing code is, is generally difficult. I don't want to, uh, you know, sugarcoat it. Um, but uh, we've got a link to the documentation right here. So a little question mark. Um, we also shared that in the chat. So uh, hopefully you guys have had a chance to uh, to look at the documentation. I will definitely be referencing this um, throughout because uh, even an expert like me, I can't remember everything. I don't know every single function and exactly how it works. Um, you know, that's why we have reference materials and uh, the reference materials on the wiki are really, really good. Um, then our last options are, um, you know, these two, we've got the ability to sum over sub items. This is really helpful um, for uh, doing all sorts of things, generally, you know, rolling up. So like if we want to identify items that match a certain criteria, we might return zero or one based on whether they match. And then, you know, we can just roll up those ones. And that way we see at like the top level, like, oh, this Epic has three overdue items or three items that look like this, items that match this um, formula. There's other ways of summing over sub items and, and we will talk about the different ways that we can do that, but this just becomes a really, really nice um, option. And then the output format, um, we're often going to want to change. General, we can think of as being kind of the raw format. So whatever my formula returns, if it's in general, it's going to return that as a raw value. Um, so we start off with the simplest formula that we can possibly make, and that's going to be one variable. So either assignee, level, story points, um, you know, any, any single field that we have, we can just make that into a formula column. And then we can start to do some interesting things with that from there. Um, do see some, okay, looks like we've got some questions coming in the chat. Um, so if we throw in some things like these simple formulas, due date or remaining estimate, um, we're just gonna get these very, very large numbers. Um, this is because the raw data is a very, very large number. So instead of having a due date, like you know September 1st or something, um, it's actually storing the number of seconds since 1970. <laughs> this is just a very common uh, you know, coding paradigm. It's just because numbers are easier to deal with than, uh, than date strings. Um, so we've got this really, really big number. I have no idea what date this is. There's no like easy, meaningful way to uh, to make sense of it. Um, but all we need to do is change this output format, and this will start presenting much nicer. The same over here. This one is a duration. Um, durations are going to work slightly differently. These are represented in milliseconds. So um, you know the first three zeros are all just milliseconds. So that means a thousand in this field would be one second. Um, so 5,400 is probably a couple days or something. And then we can go to the next one. Oh, a couple hours, actually, not even days. Um, so um, now that we've changed the output format, we see some nice values. So, um, you know, we can see some values uh, earlier this year and, and earlier last year, uh, and some remaining estimates that are in the nice, uh, you know, easily readable human format that we expect from, uh, from JIRA. So just be aware, you know, you might get some weird big numbers, but just uh, remember to look at your output formatting uh, when you run into problems like those. So um, what happened in these was I just wrote the formula. I just wrote due date. I just wrote remaining estimate. And we get this little check mark down here, which tells me um, expert knows what I mean. Um, now, these are, of course, built-in fields to JIRA. I would expect them to be on virtually every instance. Maybe you've changed due date to end date or, or completion date or some other field. 
Um, even if it's not one of the built-ins, Expert is going to do a good job of guessing what those names are. Um, be aware there might be name collisions. So if we had, um, you know, another one called like remaining estimate, something else, maybe we'll get confused. Maybe we'll kind of like run up on some different values. So be, be careful if you have some similarly named values. But in general, when we spell out these names fully and in their kind of long form, uh, Expert does a really good job of guessing what we mean. So first thing I want to talk about here is variable naming. So um, we can't have spaces in our variable name. So we're either going to be doing camel case where we have story points and like we capitalize the points or uh, camel case, I guess, where we're kind of uh, just or title case where we're, uh, you know, capitalizing everything. Or we can just use underscores. Um, I particularly like underscores. I find them to be a little bit more readable so that way we don't have to parse out, you know, where the different words uh, begin. But um, this is all up to you. All four of these will be picked up pretty well, pretty easily and, and kind of um, converted over to an a variable name. These bad variable names here, like S P O E S X Y Z, anything like that, those are going to be really bad variable names. And I know that it's very tempting to be like, oh, well, I'm just I'm doing something really simple, and I just need you know X does this really really quick and and whatever. Um, that's a really <laughs> bad road to go down because I promise you, at some point in the future, you will either need to change or update the uh, the formula. And you're gonna have no idea what you're talking about with X. You're gonna have no idea what these variables mean. Um, and it's not gonna be clear what you're doing. So um, I urge you, you know, write it out long form, make it look like a sentence, make it look like something that we can read rather than, uh, you know, kind of an alphabet soup that we're trying to figure out what, uh, what we're trying to abbreviate here. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, highly similar names or, or duplicated names um, can cause problems. I, uh, I dealt with one customer who had an instance that was like, they had original estimate and then they had original estimate dollar sign. And uh, expert would sometimes get confused because well, it'll filter out special characters like dollar sign. So we thought original estimate and original estimate dollar sign were basically the same value. Um, so it wasn't quite sure which ones to do. If you don't have highly similar names, like a couple characters off, um, I wouldn't worry about it too much, but um, just something to think about um, and we'll definitely talk about how we can check those variables and make sure that they're pointing to the right thing. So all the variables I've been talking about up to this point are being defined based on JIRA fields. So like story points is a field, original estimate is a field, due date is a field in JIRA. Um, but we can also define local variables. And so with these local variables, we can do something that's like an attribute. So here I'm defining average cost. And again, average cost is not a field in JIRA cost is a field in JIRA. And now I'm taking the average of that cost field. Um, note these curly brackets. They're sometimes called mustache brackets. I'm not sure uh, how obvious it is to see the bracket type here. Um, but these curly brackets um, always tell me that um, we're working with the hierarchy. So if I'm at the epic and I've got stories and I've got subtasks underneath, this average is taking everything underneath the epic. So um, it'll take the average or the cost on the epic. It'll take the cost on the stories. It'll take the cost on the uh, on the subtest, and it will average them all out, assuming that they're all of uh, of equal value there. And and that's what's going to get our average cost here. Um, so obviously a very very simple example, but there's a lot of really interesting things that we can do looking around the hierarchy. With um, these are what we call aggregate functions. So. Let's uh, dig into uh, functions. Now that we know what variables we have access to, um, we can talk about um, functions. So the ones we were just talking about are of course aggregate functions with those uh, mustache brackets. These ones with the parentheses are um, local functions. So, um, so this if is a local function, it's got like a parenthesis, and then we take an argument. So what I'm saying here is if the due date is before today, then print overdue on the line. So uh, I'm just going to mark some items that are overdue. Um, you know, we might want to change this, make it a little bit more complicated for a real uh, world example. I might do something like, you know, if due date is before today and the status category is not done. So like undone items that are, um, you know, have a due date in the past. You know, if an item is done and its due date is in the past, maybe we don't really care. Um, this one is interesting with max because a lot of these functions have both versions. So we have max with curly brackets and we have max with uh, parentheses, just like we have average in both forms. Um, so when we're using parentheses, we're talking about the stuff here. So I'm doing max of the due date and the resolution date. 
and it's going to return whichever date is more. But these are both the dates on the current issue. We're only looking at the level that we're at. If we were using curly brackets, we would be looking at the max of items underneath in the hierarchy. So it's just a matter of context. You know, what are we talking about? What values are we looking at? Then um, this all function here is just checking um, that all of these are true. Um, just like a lot of programming languages, you know, we'll expect zero to be false. We'll expect any positive number to be true. Um, and we'll expect, you know, any string to be true. So basically what this is checking is that these values exist. So if assignee was empty, it would be false. If there wasn't a fixed version or if there wasn't a due date, any of these not existing would treat would uh, would result in this being false. This is basically saying all of these exist. All of these return non-zero, non-blank values. Um, and then this bottom one, we get a little bit more complicated, um, but um, ultimately the goal is very, very simple. Um, I see a lot of customers who have um, labels and because you can put anything in labels, it's very, very easy for that to become just kind of a garbage dump of either misspelled or misused labels. Maybe some labels are for teams and some labels are for, uh, you know, components and, and different sorts of information. So if you've got a whole bunch of junk in labels, what we can do is we can filter that out. So I'm saying, give me labels and then filter it out. And I'm checking to see if this array, red, green, blue, contains the label. So basically, if I had a bunch of labels, this would only return these three from the array, red, green, and blue. So, um, you know, maybe I have 10 labels and one of them is red. I'm filtering out everything else except for red because maybe these are my team names or maybe they're, um, you know, status colors or something. Um, you know, th this could be a lot of different things, um, but this is just a nice way of filtering out that junk, kind of cutting to like, these are the important things. This is what I want to see and what I want to focus on. So. We've also got this idea of aggregate functions. Um, and so aggregate functions are working on the hierarchy. Um, they also have the option to uh, have option, ah, that's sort of a backward way to put it, um, but they allow options to be passed. So these little um, hashtag options um, we can add and we can add multiple of them. So um, here I've got another labels example. So what I'm doing is I'm joining distinct labels because maybe we're at the epic level. I have a bunch of stories underneath and if there are three stories that all have the same labels because they're all assigned to the same team or all you know, in some way similar. Um, I don't care. I don't wanna see green five times. I only wanna see that once. So distinct is gonna say, remove any duplicates. I just want all the unique values. Um, so this can be a nice way of rolling up information so we can see every single label that's down below us in the hierarchy. Um, this one's interesting too, um, some preceding story points. So um, if we're looking at a backlog, this can be a really nice way of calculating, um, you know, how much work is to get there. So maybe the top item in the backlog is one story point, and then there's some other points with more. And we can look down and we can say, oh, okay, this item has 50 story points ahead of it. So maybe we're doing 10 story points a week or something. So this is five weeks out before we're going to be able to start working on this item. It's a nice way of um, understanding the timeline, uh, trying to estimate the backlog at a high level. Um, and then um, here we've got a very similar one. We saw average cost before. Um, the only difference between average cost and average strict cost is whether we're including the current row. So if we're at the epic level and I do average cost, it's going to include the epics cost and, and it's going to average that in with all of the children. If I do average strict cost, it's looking below, but it's not including the current row. So if I'm at the Epic, the Epic itself is ignored. Its cost doesn't affect it, but everything underneath, all the stories, all the subtasks and whatever might be lower, those are all going to be considered um, in the cost. Um, but of course, these are all examples where we're adding one. We can add multiple. There's, there's no reason why we're limited to, to only adding one. Uh, just trying to keep these examples understandable. So let's try to, uh, to write some formulas. So um, these are some like real examples of, of things that I've uh, seen customers uh, use this for. And uh, we can just kind of, we can just kind of copy and paste and start uh, working with these. So um, this one is really simple. I like it just because even if you're not maybe super familiar with, uh, with coding, this is something that, um, that we can understand pretty easily. So um, I'll add my formula column over here and um, we can call this my test. Um, and we can see 
It's just giving me the days between updated and now, and it knows what updated is. We can see that it's looking at the updated field. Of course, if I wanted to change this, I could say, you know, oh, actually, I want this to look at target end, or I want this to look at created, or I want this to look at some other field. Um, but um, yeah, updated is what we want it to, uh, to look at. And now we can see um, this is how many days since the last update of this item. And if I make a change, like let's say I move this one back to to do uh, or backlog. So I've now updated that item and we see structure or expert more specifically is listening for those updates. So this transitions to zero because this was updated today. There are zero days between today and today. Um, so that, that's basically what the calculation is, uh, is telling us. Um, this one is really helpful. You know, if we've got a bunch of items with different due dates, we want to see when the furthest one out. So like the max due date of the children will hopefully tell us, you know, when we expect this epic to be done. So I'll open up test again. We'll change this um, and do this. So this is my max children due date. And again, we see I've got that huge number here and that's because this is in general. So I'm still returning the raw format. I don't want the raw format. I've got a date time here. I want to see this in the date format. And so we can see the latest due date for uh, for our Mars project right here is um, is going to be the tenth of uh, of this month. So a little bit in the past here, actually. Um, so maybe that's something that I want to look at. Maybe that's uh, causing some problems. Maybe I don't actually have due dates in most of my uh, fields here. So maybe that's not the best uh, example. Um, this one is really interesting because this is a counterexample. So what's happening here is this JQL function is pretending to be an aggregate function. It's not an aggregate function. Um, this is the only one with curly brackets that's not an aggregate function. And, and so what this is doing is um, this is just running, oh, this is running the JQL that we give it. Um, so if anything was created in within the past four weeks, we're gonna call that scope creep. Um, so I do have some items that were created recently. So maybe I haven't been managing scope very well. Um, the important thing to understand about this is we cannot put any values in here. So I, I can't, I can't do something like this where I say, um, yeah, I want to say like, you know, with time equals, um, you know, negative four weeks, um, no, 14 weeks, um, I can't put this in here. If I if I try to put a variable in here, this is not going to work. Um, the, there are some uh, performance reasons for this, uh, also some complexity reasons for this, um, but ultimately it's just important to realize we can only put in um, that raw text here. So, uh, so this is fine, but we're not gonna be able to insert a, uh, a variable. And the way that this works is we're running this JQL on the current issue. So we can think of this as saying, um, you know, is the current issue created less than four weeks ago? Um, and then so we're applying it to that. Um, in all other cases where we're looking at curly brackets, we would expect to be either looking down or looking up the hierarchy. Um, this is the only one with curly brackets that is just looking at the current row. So, so an important counterexample to be aware of. Um, then this one is what I was talking about before. I might actually want to switch structures here. Um, so I have a, I have a scrum structure, so I can go to my scrum structure here and I will switch back to my basic view um, and add a formula column again. And this one will be um, uh, Yeah, it's time to um, time to get to this item. So uh, I'm assuming that my weekly velocity is 10. So I'm getting 10 story points done a week. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum all the preceding story points and I'm going to um, and I'm going to divide that by the velocity. So I'm going to say, you know, if I've got 20 story points, I'm going to divide that by 10 uh, story points per week and I'm going to get a number of weeks. So that's what this concat is doing. I'm concatting a W on the end and I'll save this. And uh, now we can see at the top here, this is expected to take zero weeks. Oh, wow, do we have no story points? Hmm. 
ah, it didn't know what story points was. So I wasn't pointing it to anything. Uh, so I will point it to story points. Yep, and now we're getting some values. So right here at the top, it's gonna take zero because there's nothing above it. Then this one is five points. So that's about roughly half a week. And then we'll keep going down and we can go to the backlog and it's like, all right, we expect it to take four weeks before we can get to the Apache upgrade. Um, now we've got an idea. Um, now, you know, obviously this is going to rely on how good your data is, how good your estimates are. You know, I don't think of expert as, you know, solving all your problems or answering all your questions. I think of it more as this is a great place to start the conversation. You know, looking at the data that we have, this is what we came up with for an estimate. Is this a reasonable estimate? Does this reflect reality? Can we plan around this? What degree of confidence do we have in this number? Um, and that becomes your jumping off point for answering all the rest of those questions. Um, but just like everything else in expert, it's gonna be highly dependent on your context. So uh, this last one here is, is possibly uh, the most complicated or maybe the simplest, depending on how you think of it. Um, so what this one is doing is it's just calculating progress here. So this is gonna give us a progress value and, uh, and oh, I'll delete all of this, put this in. So what I'm saying here is if the original estimate exists, give me the time spent plus the remaining estimate divided by the original estimate. Now, the reason why this is important is because if we don't check this, we might have an original estimate of zero. And if we divide by zero, we're not gonna have a good time. That's pretty much universal to all programming languages. Even, even a basic calculator is not gonna like that. Um, and then if we don't have an estimate, we're just gonna say not estimated. So yeah, I expect a lot of these are not estimated. And then a lot of other ones have some very strange values. So uh, maybe this would be better changed to percentage. Um, so yeah, some of these are well over 100%. So we did a bad job of estimating them. We logged much more work um, than we had originally intended. Um, so maybe this 500% or 333%, maybe that's communicating some sort of risk. Maybe that's, um, you know, a, a problem that was going on. Um, you know, it, this is all demo data, so I'm not actually worried about any of these things. But, um, you know, this is where we start to ask the questions and kind of uh, take this data and, and use it as a jumping off point. So I see some questions coming through the, uh, the chat here. Um, I'll try to, uh, to answer them. Um, so I'm using the fo following formula to show issue links of a certain link type. Is there any way to show the issue type icon avocar? Um, all right. So this is a great question, uh, Dave. Um, so the following formula um, will only work on, uh, on, on server. So, uh, so we can talk about this, um, but, um, but you know, this is, this is gonna fail right here. Um, so, come on. So this is his formula. Um, so what we've done here is we're defining a function. That function is called format um, and we're passing it an issue variable. And then we're gonna take out the issue key and the issue URL and put it in here. And, and I think what we're trying to do here is wiki markup. So this is the wiki markup syntax. It's got blocking and then the issue key and the issue URL. So basically you'll click on the issue key to get the issue URL. Um, so we don't support wiki markup yet. So there's not the option for uh, for doing wiki markup. And more importantly, we don't have access to, uh, to issue links. So issue links um, gives us access to all the links to the current issue. Um, there's a lot of cool things that we can do with that, but currently it's only available on the uh, on the server side. So um, we don't have access to issue links, and it doesn't know what this is um, on on the uh, on the on-prem side. This would be referring to the current issue. Um, so uh, so what we're saying here is we're looking for an inward link of this type. It points to the current issue, um, and then we want to return it as a formatted. Um, clickable URL link. So again, this would work uh, correctly on uh, on server, I would expect. I, I can't, uh, I don't think it's worth going into and testing on a whole different environment right now. Um, but these are things that are definitely coming to a future version of, uh, of expert. And there's a lot of cool questions that we can ask once we have access to the links. Um, so, so definitely watch out for, uh, for that. Um, 
Can any of these fields as per expert functions be used in other places in JIRA, dashboards, reports, et cetera? Um, so no, these uh, fields are only available in structure. So um, when we create a formula column, it's being calculated in structure. It's only doing anything when we're actually opening up the structure and, uh, and viewing it. Um, this of course means that, um, you know, if we're looking at a, um, at a view of structure somewhere other than the, the structure screen, like the issue details or something like that, um, we might be able to, uh, to see these. Um, but um, there is, uh, again, I hate to keep talking about the future state of things rather than the current state of things. There is another feature coming, I would expect it uh, later this year, hopefully in Q2, um, called effectors. And what effectors do is they allow us to copy from a formula into a field. So if we wanted to, you know, calculate the risk associated with different items or different initiatives, we could use an effector to copy them into a field. And then once that data is available in a JIRA field, you can access it everywhere um, without too much uh, hassle. So um, yeah, right now we are limited to only being able to view formula columns in structure, um, but in a future version, we will have effectors. And so you can copy that data into a field and use it all over the place. Uh, yeah, so, and then Alex uh, Minsik here, uh, you said in quote unquote theory, you could use other attributes than Jira fields. Um, I, that was probably a misspeak. Um, I, I often say in theory to kind of hedge my bets here, but in practice, we can use things um, that are uh, other than Jira fields. We can um, use both attributes and Jira fields in formulas today. And an example of this is my favorite attribute, which is level. Um, so we use level for all sorts of things. Um, and if you just do a formula like this, um, it'll just tell you what level things are on. So we want to return general instead of percentage. And you can see, you know, this is level one, this is level two, and I've only got a two level hierarchy here. So, um, you know, but if you have a lot of levels, um, maybe you want to change your uh, effectors or sorry, you want to change your um, your extenders or something and change the levels that they work on. Having a level formula column to show you which level different things are at can be really, really helpful. So you know, if I switch back here, I'll do the same thing. Simplest formula ever, just the word level. Um, and we can see it much better here because, um, and of course it thinks Every single one is 1969, because as I said, it started in 1970. And with the time change, it brings it down to uh, December 31st. And now we can see the level that we're at. So my themes are my top level, initiatives are level two, then I have projects at level three and epics at level four. So um, and if you don't want to count the indentation or try to figure these things out, um, just having a formula column to show this is really helpful. And of course, level is an attribute of the structure itself. It's not um, based on any JIRA field, so to speak. Um, the second part of your question is, when are Gantt attributes going to be available for use in formulas? Um, that is a great question. And for that, we should go to the documentation. So I will go to the documentation here, wiki.almworks.com. We can go to structure for JIRA. It does open data center by default, so we'll want to switch over to, uh, to cloud. And um, we have a roadmap. And so we can look at the roadmap here. And um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place. Um, so it is actually on the Gantt roadmap, not on the <laughs> structure roadmap, even though we're making these Gantt fields available in structure. I think of them as a structure field, um, but, um, but it's of course on the cloud roadmap. Um, so we do have a roadmap for all of our products. I would definitely recommend um, taking a look at it. And um, Gantt attributes and structure, we can see that this is literally the next thing. All of these other ones on top are, uh, are done. So I would say, um, I would expect Gantt attributes to be available in structure um, by the end of the next quarter. So we're, we're just at the end of Q1 here, obviously. Um, but yeah, by the end of Q2, I would expect us to have um, Gantt attributes and structure. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a better estimate in a, uh, in a month or so. Does expert support custom field IDs? That is another great question. Um, the answer is yes. Um, so uh, if we go back, I will go to um, structure and then cloud and then formulas. 
And then inside of formulas, we will see that we have um, do variables. Um, it does support the custom field IDs. I just cannot find the um, page for it. Ah, so here we are. It's in the standard variable reference. And inside the standard variable reference, we can see um, that we do have uh, our right? true fields. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. I'm I'm quite sure that we can access items by um, their custom field ID, but I will double check on uh, on that. It's definitely available on uh, on server. So even if it's not available on cloud, it's something that we will um, bring in the future. But I will I will double check on that because um, naturally we want expert to work well with those custom fields. Um, you know. Almost every customer that I talk to has customizations with Jira fields, Jira links, um, and Jira issue types. So all of those things are intended to play very nicely with uh, with structure. Um, yeah. So then, a Durant here has a good question. When you have similarly named variables, you said be careful. Does that mean the formula could get confused or just be sure to use the correct variable? Um, it does mean that expert could be confused. So, um, you know, if we've got two very similarly named uh, variables, um, you know, it might not know. So um, here it's grabbing level. It knows what level is because I have nothing else, you know, named similarly. There, there's no other thing. Um, but um, if I had, I don't, I don't actually have any um, badly named fields that are highly similar because it's kind of an anti-pattern. But, um, but yeah, if, if we had like priority and, and projects priority or something like that, very, very similar, like the exact same word or, or priority and priorities or something like that, um, we might worry about um, expert getting confused and, and finding a, um, a different variable. But um, I mean, we can always check. If you ever get something that looks weird, it doesn't seem like it's returning the right thing, like check your variables, make sure that it's pointing to the right field, the, the thing that you want it to uh, to use. Because, you know, obviously we want to spell out our variable names. We want it to grab by the full name, um, but uh, it's not perfect. It's not always going to be right. So just, um, you know, be aware that you might need to uh, to double check the, um, the variables that you've defined. Um. Um, so, um, this, uh, there's another question here, um, by Mike. Um, the first one is how do we show dependencies and structure using the standard dependency relationship in JIRA? Um, this is more of a structure question and, and less of a, a formula question, but we can, we can talk about it. Um, so we just want to extend based on linked items like this. And, and so, you know, if I have a depends, uh, link type, you know, I would use that here. I don't, um, but I would use, you know, implements or uh, or whatever link type I uh, I want here, and that's how I'd create the relationship. And then this relationship is going to be used for looking up and down the hierarchy. So um, we need to make sure that we build our structure in a way um, that makes sense for the expert formula that we're uh, trying to write. And then your second question is. Can we create a Jira structure calculated on a field using formulas that convert teacher size on an epic to a number? Uh, for example, this. Um, and I'm literally going to copy this and uh, and and use his example as uh, as real code here because that's that's how close this is. So um, so yeah, if we've got something like this and we want to convert um, t-shirt size to a uh, a value, we can just do that like this, and we'll do case. Um, I don't have a t-shirt size, but we can just, you know, pretend that the t-shirt size variable exists. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, so a case statement is basically defining um, different possible output values. And uh, and then 
it's going to return. So what I'm saying is the case is based on the t-shirt. And if the t-shirt is this value, return this. And, and we'll do the same for all of these. So I'll say, you know, if the t-shirt value is X, is X extra small, return one. If it's small, return two, um, et cetera. And, uh, and this is just the whole thing. Um, so yeah, I can just... Um, so I don't wanna go too deep into this. Um, I'll just delete the last couple just to keep it a little bit shorter. Um, but, um, but yeah, so basically the case statement, and this is the exact same we could do, um, you know, if, if it was an if, I would say, you know, if t-shirt equals extra small return one, if t-shirt equals small return two, um, this is just a more concise way of, uh, of doing it. But these values on the left are the t-shirt values, and these are the numbers that we're going to return. Um, it's not going to know what t-shirt is because I don't have a, uh, a value for it. And I missed a colon, a semicolon right there. Um, so yeah, so it doesn't know what t-shirt is. Um, but um, I'm trying to think if I have something. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really have an appropriate field to, uh, to use for this. Um, but something like this um, is, is a really nice way to... Um, to change, you know, something like t-shirt values or some sort of amorphous estimate into um, a more reasonable value. Um, I've also seen this used with like Fibonacci um, story points because like maybe two story points and five story points aren't really two and a half times like a ratio. Maybe five story points is more like a week and, and two story points is more like a day. Um, you know, we can have a lot of translations to try to uh, smooth out those values. Um, so does structure formula have the ability to pull resource usage values from Gantt? No, it does not. Um, we do have the intention to bring in um, Gantt attributes in, uh, in structure. There's a lot of information in the Gantt attributes, um, but I don't think resource usage is um, going to be in the first iteration. Um, maybe that's something that we could uh, have in a future iteration. Um, is it possible to color a full line instead of just one cell? Um, that's not possible on, uh, on, on the server version where we have wiki markup where we can color the cell. Um, on cloud, we can't color the cell at all. But again, that is uh, coming later this year. Um, can I color formula fields in Jira Cloud to highlight formula result? No, that is not possible just yet. That would be wiki markup, um, which I, as I mentioned, is coming in a, uh, in a future version. Ah, newbie question. I am struggling to edit formulas after first creation. This happens to me all the time. Um, you see when I click here, it goes into, uh, into edit mode, but sometimes if you click save, um, you know, you'll, you'll be here and you'll like put your cursor in and it won't, um, it won't let you do anything. So like I sometimes start typing and it's not letting me do anything. Just click edit and, and then you can start to, to mess with things here. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why that misbehaves sometimes, but I've, I've run into that myself. Is there a different in formula support between on-prem and cloud? Uh, absolutely not. We, uh, we pride ourselves on our support. We have a very active support team, uh, cloud or on-prem or, or whatever, uh, you know, you can definitely um, get support for your formulas. So please um, reach out to our support team, support at ALMworks. Um, if you do have questions or run into a formula problem, um, they're definitely there to uh, there to help. Um, do you have any product to be able to generate reports with graphs? Um, so that is one of the things that I often say structure is not good at. Structure is good at the Excel view. You know, if we want to have um, different pieces of data in different cells, like a table. Um, it's really good at that. It does not have any data visualization cap uh, capacity. So if we wanted to do something like that, I would just export the uh, the chart to Excel, and then Excel will be a really great place to um, to make those nice graphs. Um, or of course, you can upload it from there into another uh, platform. Are there any scenarios to avoid that cause performance problems? As an example, we had someone create a structure with 20 plus folders with their own generators that brought structure to its knees. This looks powerful and I want to see if there's anything to avoid. Um, 
Yeah, so that is a good question. Um, there's a couple different things to consider here. So um, there, there are two dimensions to structure that um, we're worried about with performance. Um, one is size. If we've got a very, very large structure um, in cloud, you know, I'm talking 5,000 plus issues, um, that might be a bottleneck for um, performance. Um, the other thing that's important is if we have a really, really deep hierarchy. Um, so here, I don't necessarily have the deepest hierarchy, but I do have quite a few levels of, uh, of hierarchy. The reason why the depth of hierarchy um, can be a bottleneck is because these things have to be done um, in order. They have to be done sequentially. So I insert this top level item core products, and then I'm looking for an implements link to find its sub items. So I follow that implements link and I insert this initiative underneath. Then I have to do the same thing over again. I start looking for implements links and then I bring in the next child level. Um, but I can't bring in this second child level until this one is brought in. So I have to do it level by level. So I start at level one, I extend to level two, I check level two and I extend to level three. Um, so this extender process can be um, the bottleneck if we have a lot of different levels of, uh, of extension. So uh, definitely be careful with that. Um, then with respect to that, with specific regard to Exper, um, naturally the bigger the structure, the more work we're gonna have to do to calculate for every single item in the structure. And then the other thing is um, we can think of it like a flashlight, like think of Exper as like using a flashlight to look for data. If it's only looking at the current row, you know, you've only got that one row lit up. Um, you know, you're not doing a ton of work. If we're doing something like an aggregate formula that's looking at everything underneath this item and it's got a really deep hierarchy, um, you know, we might be doing a lot of work to look down. And, and just like if we were lighting all those rows up with a flashlight, that becomes a big bright area. Um, so, uh, you know, that can be a lot of work if we're constantly looking up and down the hierarchy on a very large structure um, that definitely can cause some slowness. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, if you have specific questions about like a specific structure that you want to optimize or a specific um, formula that you want to optimize, we can definitely dig into those more specifics. But, um, but yeah, at a high level, those are kind of the things that I watch out for um, to cause those performance problems. Um, oh, and there's actually, there's one more thing. And, uh, and this is, uh, so let's say I have a formula like this. Um, so I've got my average uh, cost and I'm defining that as, you know, my average strict uh, cost. So this is like the um, performant way to, um, to write the, uh, the formula. Um, and this means that if I use average cost a bunch, like, you know, average cost minus average cost or something silly like this, um, it's going to, uh, it's going to calculate this once and then it's going to, uh, it's going to use this. Um, if I did this the opposite way, you might think, well, oh, this is going to be equivalent. Like if I just, if I just replace these with the definition above, this would be exactly the same. It's not. Every time that we see this function call, we're calling this function and we're looking at the whole subtree. So this formula, even though it seems really simple, is actually looking down the hierarchy three separate times to calculate the same values. This is really, really, really inefficient. If I change it back to this, now we're only calculating this once. So if we're using those aggregate um, you know, functions, if we're doing something complex, and especially if we're using that number in two different places or more, we definitely want to assign that to a variable to avoid extra work for expert because it's not smart enough to uh, to cache this value based on the current row, um, if that makes sense. Then uh, this is a great question. Can you append text at the end of a number? For example, adding the dollar sign symbol. Um, yeah, you absolutely can. This is what I was doing right here on my velocity calculation. So some preceding story points is returning a number. Uh, and then I'm dividing it by velocity. So this is a number. And then I'm adding the letter W to the end to get like five weeks or whatever. Um, so yeah, we can totally um, add, you know, a string with a special character, like a dollar sign or, or what have you. Um, 
to uh, to format that output and, and make it look good. Um, ooh, this is a fun one. Uh, so Sharif asks, this session is awesome so far. Well, thank you so much. Um, my question is, you have a three-level hierarchy, epic task and subtask. Can you use the formula to display the epic level one key or summary on the same row in the subtask? Yes, we absolutely can. And that is a, uh, a fun one and a good one to go over here. So um, I am going to go to a different structure. Um, and so here I have, um, I'm going to remove my filter. I should have a three level hierarchy. So yeah, I've got, um, I've got my three level hierarchy here and I will add a, uh, a formula. And in that formula, I want to do something on the subtask level. So um, I would probably do it like this. I would say um, if level equals four, um, then return uh, parent level equals one um, summary. And uh, and yeah, let's let's take a look and see what we got. And just gonna add another formula to double check my uh, my level here because I might have gotten the levels wrong. It might be level three. Um, yeah. So it, oh no, it does look like my my thing is on level four. Um, it looks like I spelled parent right. Do I have to turn off the mirrors? Just to chime in, we've got one minute left. Oh, uh, sorry, I didn't realize we were we out did a of very time good already. Job covering you so close to getting questions. all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> so close. Um, um, but yeah, so the parent function is is going to do that. If I don't use level one, it's just going to pull from the parent row summary. Oh, you know what? You know what it is. What I wanted was level two because level one is the uh, is the Mars grouping here. So I want level two, um, and yeah, and we can see this is my top level summary UI HTML, and I'm pulling that in on the bottom level, um, which is the subtask level. So we could do the same thing and say you know if type equals subtask, um, we could also pull in a different field instead of the summary. Maybe we want something else, um, but. By default, if we don't have this option, what parent is going to do is it's just going to look up one level. So if I change this, it's now looking up one level. We can see that this one is called Mars 3. That's the summary. The same with this one down here. It's grabbing the new UX for large formulas. Um, so yeah, by default, parent looks up one level, but we can have some arguments to make it look at a, uh, at a different level. Um, yeah, and we're at the top of the hour. Yeah, we're at the top of the hour here. So, um, no, I really appreciate all the engagement, all the questions. Um, I think we were able to get to just about everything, which is kind of a miracle with so many people. I agree. On the call. Well done, Nick. And thank you, yeah. everyone, for all of your questions. Yeah. Well, we will We've got one lingering people. question from anonymous attendee. So, if you are happy to share your identity, we would be happy to follow up with you after the after the session. Um, yeah. Um, what's left? Our next steps. Um, if you'd like to learn more about structure, just visit that um, URL, alm.work slash structure. And if you haven't yet, please join the structure community. It's a home of a wealth of tips of the week, product updates, and more from us, and just a great place to meet other structure users, um, answering questions and the like. And if, yep, if any questions come up after the session, Please also feel free to drop us an email at solutions at almworks.com. And as promised, we'll be sending that follow up with the link to the recording. And with that, uh, it's a wrap. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Nick, for walking us through formulas. And thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope to see you next time. <laughs>